Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Manscaped has the revolutionary electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it's guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts or your chest because you can use it upstairs and downstairs. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Keely Rankin. She is a sex and relationship coach. Keely, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Holly. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here. So, Keely, let's start from the beginning. How did you get interested in your line of work? Yeah, so I'll give the the shortened version of it, but... Um, growing up from like the age that I could even speak, I was obsessed with horses and luckily my parents let me pursue that passion for a very long time. Wait. Okay. Um, I know that when we started this, I wasn't going to interrupt you, but wait, are you for real? Because I was a three do it three day equestrian eventer. Uh, me too. No way. Wow. Yes. Yes. My mom is like obsessed with horses. I got my, I was on a horse before oh. I could walk. I get my first pony at seven. I'm so jealous. And oh, I was I'm like so a huge <laughs> eventer. And that's oh my a very, gosh, that's so wild. And that's such a, it's actually a very specific um, like class of horseback riding. A lot of people aren't specifically three-day eventers. A lot of times they're more hunter-jumper. Uh-huh. Yes. No, I am a three-day eventer, true and true. <laughs> oh my God, that's crazy. What level did you go up to? That's so fun. Um, well... I ended up just r- running through prelim. I always had young green horses that I would train and bring up. And so, um, well, the story goes is like I was pretty good at riding, actually. And so I, when I was 14, I went to the Junior Olympics. The, um, what I was, qualified yeah. for the Junior Olympics in prelim right before I graduated high school. And, my, and I refused because I wanted to go to college and I didn't want to spend my life riding horses. My mother never forgave me for it. Yeah. Wow, my listeners are so not interested in this conversation. Sorry, guys. <laughs> You're like, I thought we were talking about sex. Yes, How did maybe I turn love horses? horses. <laughs> okay, well, sorry. I mean, I don't, you, maybe you had a really similar experience, but maybe you had a really similar experience. Like, horse people talk about sex a lot. And, you know, since I happened to be quite good, I would be in lessons with people that were, you know, four or five years older than me, and they'd talk about blowjobs and. I just got really comfortable. So when, you know, people my age started to reach those places, I could talk about it. I was the person everybody went to. And I just developed a lot of comfort in it, actually. I don't know if that was similar for you, but. (laughs) No, I mean, my mother was a pornographer. So sex was always kind of Mm. in the background my entire life. The two like things that define my mother is porn and horses. (laughs) Those sound like perfect things. What else do you need? Maybe some food and wine in there, but. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Okay. Sorry. Go on. So yeah. you were. So, so I was writing and I was always the person people went to, but I always actually thought I would be a professional writer. And so when I graduated college, I moved back east to ride and very quickly learned that. I don't know if it's that I didn't have what it takes, but I, I just felt like my calling was somewhere else. Like I was is kind of losing touch with the news and just wondering kind of like, is this all there is, is just riding horses. And, and also it's a lot of really hard work. It's, you know, right. seven days a week, seven thirty in the morning till the sun goes down. And I was like, and you'd travel like a gypsy and I'm like, okay, I, I think I need to figure out something else to do. And the only books that I could stay awake to were books about sex. So I was like, well, I guess I'm doing something in the sexual field. And I didn't know what that meant. And um, ended up kind of exploring different options, like, do I want to be a researcher? Do I want to do this? I honestly didn't think I would want to sit with people. I liked animals a lot more than people, but I happened to be really great at it and gradually went back and got my master's and all these other trainings and things. And um, 
I really appreciate the horses because they gave me so much access to the nonverbal, which when we're talking about relationships and sexuality and how are we in our bodies and how are we communicating, I feel like it's just, there is such a benefit of having that huge wealth of knowledge of how do, how do we use our bodies and what are we communicating and things like that. That's been really helpful in the transition from horse rider to, to uh, working around sex. <laughs> God, that's so interesting. I never really thought about it in that context because, you know, once I was like done riding horses, I was kind of like done riding horses. I, for me, my story was, was quite different. My mom really wanted me to go to the Olympics. My mom wanted me to achieve Mm. with horses, like what she hadn't. And so horseback riding was more her dream than mine. So once I was old enough to make my own decisions, I was like, bye. (laughs) Um, but definitely, I mean, so much nonverbal communication, all these subtle little movements that you do with your horse to communicate with them. I mean, you're very much in tune with your body, and that's something I had never really considered, but that's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. And I think also when people talk about having really great sex, a lot of times they are really asking about that nonverbal place. How do I communicate without communicating? And it's like, well, we all know as humans, it doesn't quite work that well, but there's a huge part of that. Like, how do we, how do we go back and forth in those places that sometimes don't have words? So if somebody comes to you and says, I I know we talked um, earlier, you were saying that lately during the pandemic, you've had a lot of couples come to you um, who I guess work kind of, you know, the pandemic did that kind of thing for all of us where it put hit pause on our lives, right. On our work lives. And all of a sudden we were forced to kind of look at our personal lives and our personal relationships in a, in a way that maybe we didn't have to before because we were so busy. So you were saying how you've had a lot of couples come to you who want to, you know, either figure out their relationship in some kind of way, probably improve communication. Um, what kind of situations did you see arise and was there a theme in terms of the struggles that these people were facing? Yeah. You know, it was, it was interesting. It's like, as people started to trickle in, there was kind of this, like, we've been putting this off for a lot of years and now we no longer feel like we can put it off. I think there was also this added pressure of like, are we all going to get sick and die? Kind of this like, you know, bigger than us fear of like, is this all there is? Is this really what, you know, we're, we're going for is just kind of this mediocre relationship. And so a lot of couples I felt like were coming and they were, they were wondering like, you know, is this, is this, can it, can our relationship, our sexual relationship get better? And can we figure out how to love each other in a deeper, more full way. And, you know, what ended up sort of, I think, kind of unfolding, especially during the pandemic, was a lot around fantasy and how are people letting themselves have fantasy? Because you couldn't really leave your house. Um, You know, many people were, you know, essentially pretty, you know, sequestered or choosing to be. You know, some people some people weren't choosing that. But so a lot of the spaces that I ended up exploring with people were this realm of fantasy and how do we bring fantasy in and what does it mean? And this huge, wonderful world of how do we start to play? Even if, you know, sometimes people think of fantasy and they think like, oh, we're going to, we have to do the things that we fantasize about. Like, oh, I'm fantasizing about a threesome. So we have to have this threesome. But it's like, how can we listen to our partners, hear what they're desiring without having to make it happen? How can can we make space for that and figure out, like, are there levels of that fantasy that if the partner that's feeling unsure about it, you know, are there layers or levels that we could incorporate in those people's play that could allow for the person who has that deeper fantasy of wanting multiple partners to explore that? So it's really just been this place of people, I think, feeling like they, they're just really wanting more. And they're kind of like, we've been putting this aside. And now, like, let's, let's work through this. Let's see what's possible between us. What's, what's the capacity of our couple sexually? 
So it sounds to me that one of the most common fantasies that you were encountering was incorporating other people into the relationships. Is that correct? Well, that's always the scariest one, oftentimes. Like one person has this desire, this interest in, an, in bringing another person into the couple, and they're afraid that their partner is going to respond in an uh, um, uncomfortable way, get mad, get angry, feel jealous. So that's kind of like the biggest one. Um, interestingly enough, did that come up a lot? Interestingly, not so much. It was, it's more just been people wanting to have the space to talk about stuff. And actually, now that I'm reflecting on it, it's a great reflection, a lot of power stuff, which would make sense. Mm. A lot of power play, right? Because we're all yeah. feeling like we don't have much power because we're stuck inside. So um, yeah, many people sort of like wanting to play with what does it mean for one person to be more powerful, for me to be dominated or for me to dominate. Right. That's so interesting. And, and even just like you said, like perhaps not fulfilling those fantasies, but just talking about them probably helps people feel so much closer because that's kind of one of those taboo topics in general, right? That, that we never discuss, um, with our friends or with our significant others or, or with the public in general, because yeah. the fantasies are generally, yeah. I find that most people are are terrified of their own fantasies because they think that it says something about them as a person. Yeah. I normally, when I talk about fantasies, I normally like make this symbol and I'm like, here are the things that you absolutely want to do before you die. And you know that, and here are the things that turn you on that, you know, you never want to do because they either feel dangerous or they're, they're really far out there and you're not actually wanting to try them. And then there's a ton of things in between mm. and it's my belief that people haven't fully reached their capacity of understanding that realm of fantasy until they've found things that actually scare them. Like mm. they've found places where they feel really shameful, that it feels scary to admit that. Because fantasy is just the access to creativity and it exists outside of the spectrum of social norms. It, it's, it's this place within ourselves that we can go to explore and it really is one of the most vulnerable places to, t to let our partners into. Like, what are we thinking about? What are we masturbating to? What are we desiring? It's such a vulnerable place. And a lot of people hold themselves back even from themselves being able to identify fantasies out of the shame and fear of like, I shouldn't like that. That's bad. And then even if they find it, it can be really difficult to share because of the level of vulnerability that comes up internally, right? It's like, wow, I really get turned on by that, but I don't want anyone to know. Esther Perel, who's such a wonderful sex therapist, she talks about the secret garden. And mm. I think that's such a beautiful kind of like phrasing for those places of like, that it's just these secret, sometimes can be these secret places that live within inside of ours, inside of us, inside ourselves. Yeah. I find that what I think most people get confused with about fantasies is that they often think of them in a literal way, right? That if you have a certain fantasy, you absolutely want to act upon it and you can have dark fantasies. Yeah, that's that, that thing, right? Right. Exactly. Like that's the, the other side. I definitely have some dark fantasies that I in no way ever want to act out ever, but like in the safety of in my head, <laughs> you know, they're, they're fun to play out. But like, if I was presented with them in real life, like I would never, I would never want to experience that. I, I, I like them as imagined yeah. places in my mind. Yeah. 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 And I really love once I get comfortable with a partner, it's like being able to talk about them openly. Right. It's like to be able to say, I'm imagining this happening or that happening, or now this is happening, or you tell me what you see and what's happening without ever leaving the bedroom. But all these things are happening around, or, you know, people are coming in, or things are happening that in real life, yeah, I don't imagine I would ever do. Um, but it's fun. So, so exciting and so sexy and liberating to get to play with. Right. Right. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back with Keely, we are going to talk about her work with premature ejaculation and so much more. So hang tight. Summer is here and Manscaped is here to help you level up your full body grooming game. 
Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it is guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts. And if you want to use it on your chest hair, it actually has different settings so you can get the perfect length, whether or not you're the kind of guy who likes to be a little bearish or maybe actually wants a bare chest, literally. You can get all of this inside the perfect package where you will find the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, as well as the crop reviver, a testy toner that is designed to give you a pep in your step. If you subscribe to the Perfect Package, you will get a blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. So what are you waiting for? Make this your best and most hairless summer ever. Go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. All right, guys, we are back. So Keely, you were saying that a bulk of your therapy is working with men who are dealing with premature ejaculation. And I know that this is something that, that plagues so many men. And so how do you counsel people on that? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I sort of found my way into, you know, helping men around the performance struggles because I was, I was actually kind of afraid when I started working as a sex coach, there was, it felt like the array of things that people could show up for felt pretty overwhelming. And, um, so I kind of picked like this, this focus of like, okay, I'm going to work with these people until I feel like I get my, my feet, my feet set. And, premature ejaculation, or I, I normally call it early ejaculation because it's happening earlier than you want it to. But it, it sort of fell into my lap. And also I think kind of chose me. My, my first um, like sexual sex intercourse penetration partner struggled with severe, what I now know is severe premature ejaculation. And it was very confusing and um, you know, I was like, you know, 15, 16. So we didn't have a lot of language around it. It's kind of like before the internet. So there wasn't many places to go to look around these different topics. And um, as we sort of moved through it, through our relationship over a couple of years, um, it, it ended up circling back around when I started my, my private practice. And so kind of over a period of like eight, 10 years, I was just working with person after person after person, well, man after man, I suppose. Like at some point, I think like 85% of my practice was people who struggled with early ejaculation. And so I was just, you know, taking pieces of things I'd read and taking back stories from clients and just kind of like throwing everything in the kitchen sink at this, this struggle that men had. And eventually started to find like really, really clear paths of like, okay, this works here, this works then, this is that. And I've, I'm very, pretty analytical. So I like this, this kind of the structure of like, you do this first and then you do that. And um, over time, it started to just become this wonderful thing where I could you know, say to men like, hey, I hear you. This is really difficult. I get it. I, and I know there's not a lot of help out there and I can probably help you. And it's, it's such a wonderful relief when I talk to people and I'm like, hey, I, I can probably help you. Like most likely, I think I can probably help you. And what ended up happening was that I was just getting inundated with people needing help. And so that's when I decided to go and create an online course, which um, anybody who's listening can, can get access to. Because it was, I realized I was like with this structure, I can just give people the tools and information and they don't actually have to come and sit in my office and talk about it. But um, you know, it's since creating the course, I've been able to kind of funnel people out towards the course versus working with me. And most people are able to kind of cure and heal that, that issue within that. But I still feel really passionate about bringing it to the population and talking about it because there's so much shame and so many men struggle with feeling insecure around how quickly they orgasm. And I think it's, such an important topic to just normalize and, and say like, you don't, I mean, some of the clients I've worked with is like, 
they are suicidal. They have, you know, moved home with their parents and completely quit dating. I mean, it's just heartbreaking stories around the fear of like, what if I ejaculate quickly and this person judges me? And so I, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about like, let's talk about this. Let's let men know that like, there is help. There is help out there. They're not alone. And it's, it's not a death sentence or like a relationship ending sentence either. So I think it's really important. That's so crazy, but not surprising at all that men can base so much of their self-worth on their sexual performance. And, you know, of course, I think a big part of that is the way society puts pressure on, you know, what it defines as a man and, you know, masculinity and the role that men have to play in the bedroom. And, one of the amazing gifts of this podcast is being able to talk to so many different people, educators such as yourself, but also other men who, you know, look at sex differently, look at their gender roles differently and has really kind of opened my eyes to, you know, what if we gave people a little bit more freedom in terms of, you know, just sexual freedom, like what they're comfortable with, like, and, and and we didn't hold people to these rigid roles of like what a man is, what a woman is, how you have to perform, what sex is supposed to look like. What I see is that so many men feel an immense amount of pressure to get hard, stay hard. You know, it's like, don't come too soon, but don't come too late. I mean, there's all these rules, like you were just speaking to, there are all of these rules that I think you know, men and women feel like they have to follow during sex. And I think really helping people get number one free of that box. I talk about it like a box. It's like getting free of that box and figuring out what is in sex for them. What do they enjoy? What is pleasurable? And kind of at the roots of of the way that I treat early ejaculation is actually helping men find their pleasure. Like I, 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 totally understand that there may be this desire to, you know, last longer because they think it will pleasure their partner, which can be true depending on the type of sex you enjoy having. Yeah. It depends. Or if it doesn't go on for too long. Yeah, it, yeah. Well, so, and then that's the added pressure for men who struggle with delayed ejaculation. So right. the three main, main performance struggles for men is delayed ejaculation, um, a premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction, right? So there's all, it's, it gets tricky. It gets really tricky. But I think the most important thing is how are we teaching people about pleasure? And for the premature people who struggle with premature ejaculation, oftentimes you ask them about pleasure. They have no relationship with their erotic pleasure. Everything is happening so quickly. There isn't actually a sensation of, oh, that felt good. There's just, oh my gosh, and I'm coming. And I feel ashamed and embarrassed and um, my partner is going to be mad. And I mean, it, it's not actually the experience of like, oh, that was wonderful. Like, I love you, honey. Let's snuggle. It's this freeze and, oh my gosh, I wonder what she thinks. And I got to, sometimes there's the, I got to make something now happen with my fingers or my mouth. And so really it's about relearning how to relate with the body and for that person themselves, not for anyone else. I tell my clients, it's like, this is about you learning how to relate with the erotic pleasure inside of your body. Mm. Because what happens with early ejaculation is like the arousal starts to build and, and the body panics actually. It's almost like a fight or flight trauma response. And the nervous system just goes, whoop. And so you either lose your erection, which happens in severe premature ejaculation, or you just move right into the orgasm. And it's all happening so quickly that there's no, um, like the the person experiencing it with the body doesn't even notice it. They don't notice. I talk about it as like an anxiety curve, that their anxiety curve has just shot up. And of course their arousal curve just follows. And next thing you know, the ejaculation happens. Right. And so it's really about being able to learn to separate, like, can your arousal start to go and flow and follow what's pleasurable to your body while your anxiety stays as low as we can possibly keep it? 
And that's really the trick to being able to learn how to bring in arousal and to be able to stay in arousal and pleasure without jumping right over into that ejaculation place. You know, when you were talking about how men feel pressured to, okay, they have to get hard, they have to stay hard for a certain amount of time and they have to come up, you know, this kind of like structured idea of what Mm -hmm. sex is supposed to be like, that just made me think instantly of literally the structured way that male performers, porn stars have to perform in order for us to be able to film a scene. And, you know, one of the most common questions, of course, I get from men is like, I want to get into porn. Do you think I could be a porn performer? And I try to explain to people, it's like an incredibly difficult job. Most men can't do it because we're really asking incredibly unrealistic things of the human body when it comes to porn. Like there's no doubt about it, you know? And, and I actually hosted a show for Playboy TV called Adult Film School And the premise was that real life couples came in and did, you know, I kind of curated this personal sex tape for them, right? This professional sex tape. So the idea was that- This sounds really fun. I love this. Are you doing it again? (laughs) No. It was was fun. I very much enjoyed the experience. Um, It it was a great, great, great experience for me. But- working with these couples was so difficult because you took guys with no experience in performing in front of the camera and you put them on a stage with like 30 people in the crew and, you know, a boom hanging above their head, all these lights. And it's like, okay, go and give me like a 30 minute scene and start the whole time. And then like, you need to like, come on command because I need to make sure that my camera's in the right position to catch it. And so many guys came in very cocky, you know, because they were swingers and they would have sex with, Mm. you know, their wives in front of other people at parties. And so they were like, Oh, I can totally do this. But there's something so different between like that kind of relaxed atmosphere where there's music playing in the background. Maybe everybody's had, you know, a couple of drinks versus like being in a completely silent sound stage with all these people looking at you and, you know, me kind of like, all right, it's time to get hard now. And I mean, you know, like 80% yeah, of yeah. the guys failed even when they took Viagra or something along those lines And so like, I really saw the disconnect that, that men have with, you know, what it's actually like to perform on camera versus what they think it's going to be like. So I guess my question is, do you think that, that men, especially this new generation where, you know, the internet porn and porn is accessible to everybody so easily. And, you know, we've got these crazy sex acts that are being performed on camera that like, you know, anybody can see have men, grown up looking at porn, do they, have they ingested that in a way that they think that that's the way I'm supposed to be? I'm supposed to be able to perform like a porn star. And if I can't, you know, do these crazy sex acts, um, am I not worth anything? Has that had an influence, do you think, on the way that, that men perceive themselves in the bedroom? I would say a hundred percent. And, and women as well, too. But just to stick with the men piece, 100%. I think there is starting to be more awareness and men are starting to say like, yeah, obviously that's not real. But I think deep down inside of people's minds is this feeling of like, that's what it's supposed to look like. Size is a big piece. And also how long I last and how fast I can go while I last long. And that's the piece where it's always about coming back to pleasure because it's like, what actually feels good for your body? What feels good on your cock? Going quickly and hammering, you know, like a jackhammer, if that feels good, great. But if it doesn't, that's not the type of energy that your partner is going to enjoy because you're not actually connected with your body, which means you're not bringing any of your desire, which means the connection can't actually start to flow. And so it's not going to be pleasurable, but there's just, there's no way around it. I mean, porn is such an interesting 
educational perspective. I think on some levels, I actually assign my couples to watch porn. Like it, it, it can be really helpful in freeing and helping with some imagination stuff. But if it's the only outlet that people go to, especially for masturbation, this is normally what ends up happening. Like m- people learn they can't masturbate without porn. So every time they go to masturbate or self-pleasure, they turn to porn and then they can't create any of their own fantasies. And then they're just watching this like really exciting thing and just taking that in and integrating it in. And of course, comparing themselves along the way, because that's what Mm. we humans do. We compare ourselves for sure. No way around that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, nothing's made that more obvious than social media. I mean, you know, just just think, look at like how you feel about yourself once you scroll through Instagram and you see all these people who are like living their best life that you feel like you're not comparing. That's, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I think there's also this added pressure too of, you know, the women who've had, you know, women who are also now enjoying porn can come in with those pressures too. Right. And Again, I always feel like it comes back to the relationship with pleasure. It's like, what is happening in our bodies? Can we advocate for our own pleasures? And can, I mean, the first place is like, do we know what's pleasurable? I mean, really, that's the first question. And then from there, how do we start to communicate those those desires and those wants and, and acting on them and feeling like we have permission to take up room for our pleasure in that moment? Yeah. Um, it's a long journey to, for people oftentimes to learn that, but it's really, really important for, for a long term pleasurable sex life, I believe. Yeah. I found that, you know, myself having, you know, being, having, I've shot porn now for like 22 years, you know, when I was younger, I think sex for me was more about performance, my performance and, and could I give the best blow job and, could I deep throat you in a way that would blow your mind? And, you know, could I live up to, it's funny because, you know, obviously I was filming these scenes. So I know what happens between takes. Like I know that, you know, people don't, I mean, not, not always. Sometimes people do literally go for like 40 minutes straight and they don't take a break and it's amazing. But most of the time it's not like that. Most of the time, you know, there's breaks, there's water breaks, I need more lube, like whatever. I'm, my penis is getting kind of soft. I need like a moment, you know, I need to take a, a breather. It's really hot in here, whatever. Um, but even, even with that knowledge, knowing that, you know, the performance isn't the way that it's edited to look like still in my brain, I'm, I would think to myself, you know, I need to behave, perform in this certain way. And I need to like do this, you know, sex needs to be really aggressive. And, and then as I've gotten older, I found that, you know, these things that I thought that I liked because I think I thought I was supposed to like them because they like seemed hot on camera and guys Mm -hmm. seemed to want to like, seemed to like that was not actually what I really liked and, and actually prefer sex that's a little slower and more vanilla and more sensual and involves like more foreplay and massage. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't really actually want you to skull fuck me. Um, turns out I'm not as into that as I, I thought I was. So, um, yeah, it's been yeah. an interesting yeah. shift in perspective. Yeah. And it's so beautiful that you have been able to take that time to reflect and to, you know, commit to your pleasure in that way to say, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to really look at what I like and, and communicate that with my partners and let go of that, you know, the box or this thing we think we're supposed to do mm. and get to find what's true for you. And I think, you know, what's also true is that our bodies change over time. Like they are, you are not the same body as you were 10 days ago, six months ago, a year ago, 10 years ago. And so it's really, really important, I think, to learn the tools of, of knowing our pleasure so that we can start to communicate that going forward over time, because it's just an ever evolving process of deepening and exploring and, you know, you may like feather touch on your arm one day and the next day it's just awful. And, um, it's those pieces, right. That I think are so important for, for really, really great sex. And, you know, it's such a tricky thing when people don't talk about sex and view porn, because that's where 
the difficulty of people feeling like it looks like that all the way through, right? Like, of course it's edited. Of course there's pauses. Of course, you know, of course all of these things. But if you're not talking about it openly, if people aren't, if you're not communicating it with your friends or people, you might start to think that that's how sex really looks, like on a, like how it ends up being produced for porn versus all of the, that it's actually a movie and that movies have takes and that they have editing and <laughs> pauses and things like that. So it's so important to just keep talk for us to all just keep talking about these things so that people don't feel misled or end up, um, end up trying to compare themselves to something that's literally not realistic. All right, guys, we're going to take another quick break and we will be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Hello, everybody. So we are back. So Keely, I understand that you are pregnant. Congratulations. I'm pregnant. <laughs> very, very exciting um, for constant listeners of my show, constant, or even if you just listened a few times in the last year, uh, you would know that um, I have a six month old baby. So I recently went through what you're going through. And um, I'm so curious, you know, to talk to mothers and prospective mothers now about the challenges of raising a sex positive child in today's world where, you know, as we kind of touched on earlier, porn is so rampant and easily accessible by children online. Um, you know, I grew up the daughter of pornographers, but it was so different in my time because the internet didn't exist when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. so the way that I got introduced to porn was I, you know, stole my mom's penthouse magazines that she had shot for, which is pretty fucking tame compared to the fact that you can go and see like triple penetration on Pornhub now, you know? So have you thought about how you're going to raise your child in this new world? I've, I've thought about it, agonized over it, freaked out about it. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> um, I'm imagining that becoming a parent for me personally will be a very big journey. Um, my husband and I both, we, we wanted to have a kid. We were trying. Um, luckily, it just took us a couple months, and that was very exciting. And for me, I think about sex positivity and the relationship with body as the foundation, I don't know, I don't know if sex positivity is the foundation, but like the relationship to your body is the foundation to be able to make decisions in the world from a place that feels right for you. And sex is just another component of how are we engaging in the world and what are we, how are we engaging with specifically pleasure? And, um, 
so I, it's, it's, it's hugely complex. And I feel like we should come back in like 10 years and have this conversation about what are the actual practical steps. So I'm more of in this theoretical space of like, how do you raise a human to value themselves, to value another person, to not hold judgments, but to also be able to hold boundaries. And I'm imagining that if, if, if you can do all that, <laughs> then I'm imagining sex will just be an easily accessible extension of a loving or non or, or relationship that wants to express um, love or um, play in that particular way. You know, I don't believe that sex always has to involve love, but I think there's some form of giving ourselves to another person, some form of this um, energetic exchange. So it's not love in this romantic sense, but it's the sharing of space and enjoyment of our bodies with other people. And so I'm sort of, I think it will be really interesting, honestly, like what will happen. I'm imagining like as my child starts to explore sexual relationships, I I can't imagine that I would have that feeling of like, no, no, they're so young. They shouldn't yet. I imagine I'll be more of the type of person of uh, the type of parent that's like, if you want to talk to me about it, I'm here. If that feels right. But if that feels like I'm not the right person, let's find you someone that can help you have honest conversations about what's right for you. And, you know, one of the things that I think happened for me as a young person was because I was exposed to all of these things, I was just thinking sex stuff was supposed to happen without really making the active decision for myself. Like it wasn't, it wasn't that it was never a choice, but it was more just like there was all this pressure of like, as you do this, you should do these things. And I would love to help give, you know, my child a choice. It's a boy, by the way. We know we're having a boy, which is Yay. exciting. <laughs> but giving him a choice you know, if he chooses to choose, if he makes the choice to stay a, a male, but, um, you know, letting him know that it's like, you, you don't have to have sex to be sex positive. You know, you don't have to do these things, but it's like, what is it that your body is wanting to do that feels like the right expression for you with, with the right people versus, you know, one of the things I hear a lot from men is like, um, well, she was wanting it, so I just did it. And I'm like, well, was it? Did were you turned on by that person? Were you attracted to them? And they like, and and sometimes the answer is like, no, not at all. Like I wasn't. I just felt like I had to. And you know, I think it's like trying to help help people navigate that is so important. Of like, again, it comes back to this place of like, where is your pleasure? What do you want to do? Um. So, yeah, I guess it's a little more like theoretical at this point than, than practical stuff. Have you, I'm curious what you've thought about. Oh, I'm just like hoping that there is technology implanted that's going to like help shield kids from porn and, you know, everybody else can access it if they want. I don't know. I'm leaving it up to like, I have no fucking idea. And to be yeah. honest... I'm not terribly worried about it because I, again, like I said, I was raised by pornographers and I feel like I have a very healthy relationship with sex. I had a wonderful childhood. Um, you know, I'm very close to my family. I've, I've had good relationships with men. Uh, I've obviously, you know, made my mistakes and, um, you know, like I'm not perfect in any way, but I, I, yeah, I'm not worried about it because I think I was, I've already been raised in that situation and, and I don't feel like it harmed me in any way. My brother and my sister are, are also very normal. Don't work in the adult industry whatsoever. Um, they're both married, um, you know, with kids. So, so I'm not terribly worried about it. I think because I've kind of already had that experience on the other end. So I just figure like, I'll just raise my daughter kind of the same way that my parents raised me and everything's going to be fine. Um, I also wasn't raised with a sense of shame around sex and nudity. So I, I don't really, I can't really comprehend the idea of being so terrified about sex and about sexuality. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, you know, there's right times to talk to your kids about, you know, 
certain things with sex. And I think also too, like I'll be more concerned about it once they start to get to the age, but since she's only six months old, I'm not somebody who worries about something that's so far in the future. Um, but you know, I really liked what you said. And I think this, this actually kind of touches upon the way that I was raised. You kind of talked about, uh, somebody's relationship with sex and, and how they handle sex just as an extension of how they handle life. You know, it just sounds to me like if you raise a child with good communication skills, um, you know, an openness, but also an ability to set boundaries just in everyday life that will kind of transfer over naturally when it comes to sex. And I think that that's, that's absolutely true. So I think that was a really astute observation and, um, and I agree with that. So yeah, I'm not, um, I don't know. I'm yeah, it's very, really worried. it's so rare that I'm having like a conversation with a, a, a person about sex and I'll say, and does this exist elsewhere in your life? Oh yeah. I mean, the answer is always yes. Mm, <laughs> it's all, yeah. it's, it's not like sex is just this small vacuum where right. these pieces mm. exist. Yeah. The other awesome thing too is I partnered with a, a Parisian and the French are so, um, they look at sex in such a brilliant way and it's such a lovely, um, their framework around all things pleasurable is, is seen as such a highly regarded and important part of their culture. And so I imagine as we progress as parents that it, there's no doubt in my mind that that part of the culture will come in as well. You know what? Another really great point. My mom's British. Oh, yeah. And my dad's South African. So my mm -hmm. parents are not American. So I, I wonder if that had something to do with it. Because I have found that, yeah, culturally, um, America with its puritanical roots it can be pretty uptight about sex compared to a lot of other European cultures and other, and other cultures, of course, in the world. But, um, yeah, the, and it, yes. And the French definitely have, are known to have like a more comfortable relationship, it seems with, with sexuality than, than other people. So I think that will work in your favor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so far. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, Keely, thank you so much. This has been a really um, amazing conversation. And can you tell everybody where they can find you online, social media and uh, your website? Yeah, Holly, it's been so lovely to chat with you and get to know you. And who would have thought that we had the three-day eventing horse riding in common? It's so rare. So it's really exciting to meet a fellow horse rider. Um, yes. Yeah, so the best way to find me is my website, which is just my first and last name. Keely, K-E-E-L-E-Y, Rankin, R-A-N-K-I-N.com. And I am a little bit here and there on Facebook, but the, the best way to find me is on Instagram. And my handle is just the tips sex coach. Fantastic. And you guys can follow me on Instagram at Holly Randall on Twitter as well. And of course, if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. I actually just started adding my fine art photography and video to that Patreon. I closed down my art Patreon because it was too many things for me to manage. And I decided I'm going to try to streamline all of my projects. So actually by joining um, my unfiltered Patreon, not only will you be supporting this podcast, you will be supporting my art book, which I will do one day, I swear. Um, and you will get access to beautiful photos and videos, as well as, you know, early releases of the podcast, exclusive Q and A's, signed books, merch, all the stuff that I offer, which of course you can see if you just visit patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Keely, again, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on the baby. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I will see you guys next week. Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that will not only not nick or snag your nuts, but can also be used on your chest hair. 
If you get it in the Perfect Package 3.0, it will come with a bunch of liquid formulas to keep you feeling and smelling fresh all day. And for a limited time, you can also get a free travel bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs that come with it. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping.